Finding Hope, The Road to Recovery. Hi, my name is John Lavitt, and I am a journalist, a writer, and the principal content creator for Tarzana Treatment Centers. Welcome today to our program, Finding Hope, A Path to Recovery. We are focusing today, the theme of today is from being in treatment to working in treatment a remarkable shift. My guest today is Jacqueline Welker, who is a social worker and who works as an outpatient counselor at Tarzana Treatment Centers, Long Beach. Jackie, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Um, So I thought that we could begin this in terms of the part where we talk about being in treatment mm-hmm. by talking about like kind of a, what got us into treatment and we can talk about our bottoms in a sense. Yeah. I mean, I know that's a sensitive topic, but I believe that by letting people know about what happened, by letting people know about how dark it got, that it shows how much of a miracle treat- treatment is. Yeah. So can you tell me something about your bottom? Well, um, my bottom, like, I thought I had hit bottom several times before, um, but this previous, this last time, the real bottom, resulted in my children being removed from my care, I had a DCFS case, um, I was in what is DCFS Department of Children and Family Service case um, I had been arrested for drug sales um, I was looking at a long period of time behind bars and um, and the relationship that I was in was violent and toxic <laughs> I was estranged from all of my family and I had nobody left, not my kids, not my parents, no one. I had dug myself into a hole, essentially. And, and I knew I needed help and I had to help myself. Like many addicts, we come to this realization that, um, or our family members come to the realization that they can't force us into recovery. They can't force sobriety on us, even though most of them try. Um, I was ready. I was ready. And I, you were, you were willing. I was very willing. Willingness is such a huge part of early recovery. Um, It's so difficult to be willing when you are, in the thick of your disease. Yeah. Um, My bottom was really dark. My bottom, uh, it took place on Sunset Boulevard at the uh, French Cottage Motel, which sounds really fancy dancy. It does. But it was actually a crack motel, which has since been torn down. Um, I was with my ex-wife. I had lost everything. We had lost our house. We had lost our cars. We had lost, um, we had no money. My family had cut me off and we were desperate. We were desperate also because we had a huge drug habit which cost hundreds of dollars per day and we didn't know how to pay for them. My ex-wife was a painter and that day, I had bought razor blades for her at seven at Seven Eleven. I bought the razor blades so she could cut canvas. But we were at the hotel. We had no money. We didn't know what was going on. And she said to me, "Why don't we go into the bathroom and just open up our veins?" Oh wow! Why don't Why don't we die? And it seemed like a pretty good option at the time. However. 
my friend was coming the next day to loan me money. So I was like, let's wait till he shows up and gives us the money and we can buy some more drugs and then we can uh, take it from there. <laughs> we, can, we can kill ourselves tomorrow night. <laughs> That seems totally logical. Because in, that's how a drug addict thinks. In that state of mind, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. That's, you know. like, so my friend actually showed up, not with money, but with an intervention. And he showed up with, one of my, with my best friend from college, with a friend of mine who was my drug buddy for years. The friend who, who organized the, inter the intervention was not a drug addict. He's a complete normie but he knew that I was in desperate straits. So basically he showed up and goes, John, can you come down to the coffee house? There was a coffee house next door. And it was an intervention and probably the easiest intervention ever done. Because I walked in there and I said, we are on heroin and cocaine. We need help. Please help us. And what's incredible is my two friends who were very successful, they paid for my entire rehab and my ex-wife's rehab. Wow. They paid over $30,000 and they don't expect a dime back except for me to stay sober. Uh, my wife actually went to Tarzana Treatment Centers, oh. which is incredible. She's, she's an alumni. Well she, well, she, well, she moved on and then she relapsed. Um, from uh, Actually, when she left Tarzana, I went to a second place. I went to Beit Teshuvah, which, which was a Jewish rehab mm -hmm. called the House of Return, which is uh, in, in, in Hebrew. And, um, and I stayed there for 11 months, oh. uh, both, in, um, both in primary treatment and in sober living. I was a wreck. Um, I'm a little bit heavy now. I have to lose some weight, okay? Uh, but... When I went into treatment, I mean, I weigh about 200 pounds now. When I went into treatment, I weighed 140 pounds. And when they call you the Holocaust survivor at the Jewish rehab, you know you look bad. I, yeah. <laughs> so things were desperate. Can you tell me about your experience in rehab and what really helped you? Well, so... I went to residential at Tarzana Treatment Center in Central, and um, and I was able to to do my detox and utilize mat services. I had tried in the past Suboxone, Methadone, and those weren't working for me. Now, just to clarify for people who don't know, mat services at Tarzana Treatment Centers means medications for addiction treatment. Yeah, medically assisted treatment, treatment as well. Yeah. So basically they're medications that help with the withdrawal symptoms and help you find the road to recovery. Yeah, and urges, it helps with urges as well. Um, this time, because I was a frequent flyer, I probably should have had like a member's pass. Um, this time they offered Vivitrol and it sounded too good to be true. What is Vivitrol? Vivitrol is an injection once a month, um, and it helps with urges, but it's also a opiate blocker. So even if I wanted to get high, I couldn't. It would send me into rapid, rapid withdrawal, and it would be from what I've told, the most horrible withdrawal you would ever experience in your life. Not fun. No, not fun. And <clears throat> I did try when I got out of detox. I tried, and it was not fun. It was awful. But it was what I needed to maintain my sobriety because without it, I wouldn't have been able to be sitting here right now. Um, after I did residential for a short, just a short period, um, my mom agreed to allow me to move in with her and I, 
I was incredibly grateful because we had been estranged. And I enrolled into Tarzana treatment uh, outpatient in Long Beach. And during that time, I had a wonderful counselor that was also a social worker. Before we get to your counselor, can we talk about your mom for one quick second? Yeah. Because um, I think sometimes families do not realize how remarkable family support can be. Yeah. Uh, when you were in treatment, you were so alone, you're at your bottom, and to, and to have families give you that sense of hope, yeah, that sense of belief, it's such a huge moment. Yeah, and and my mom, bless her soul. I mean, she's amazing. Um, she had it really tough with me because I started using at such a young age, and um, and seeing me struggle throughout my life and manipulate her for many, many years and for money, for whatever. She did what most, most codependents can't do. And she stopped being a codependent. She stopped enabling me. She completely closed that, that resource off to me, but she told me always, when you're really ready, when you are really willing, and you need me, call me, and I'll be there. But don't call me unless you're sober. So that door was open, but only with with a, with a willingness. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me? You mentioned um, you mentioned one of your counselors in recovery and how they helped you. Can you tell me about that counselor? Her name was Rachel, and she was she was amazing. She she put up with me, and I was not as composed as I am now. Back then, I was all over the place. My emotions were up and down, and she really met me where I was at. She. She inspired me. She guided me. Well, she used guided questions to help me come to the right conclusions on who I wanted to be and what kind of person I wanted to be. And she held me accountable for many of my actions because, to be honest, I wasn't the greatest at attending treatment in the beginning. <laughs> I wasn't the greatest at being on time or remembering my counseling sessions. Surprise, surprise. Right? I had, <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea how to adult at all. I mean, accountability, responsibility, it was so new to me. And she was so patient. She's the reason why I wanted to become a counselor in the first place. And after learning that she wasn't just a substance use disorder counselor, she was also a social worker. And she, at that time, she was earning her master's. And it inspired me to follow in her footsteps. Wow, that's an incredible story. Um, you know... I have a story about recovery as well when I was in treatment. And there was a man, his name is Rabbi Mark Bor Bor Borovitz, and he was the head of Beit Shuva for a long time. And he really helped me when uh, I went to his office and I was talking to him about spirituality. I was talking to him how I said to him, like, you know what? I felt forsaken. I felt forsaken by God or by my higher power or by whatever you want to call it. And so the fact is, if I was forsaken by God, I was going to be the most forsaken guy on the block. I'll show you forsaken. And I use that kind of as like a justification. And I'm telling him this. I'm telling him how, how, how I feel. And he goes, wow, John, you're quite a romantic. <laughs> you like romancing the idea of being forsaken? Because it has really screwed you up for years. 
How about realizing that you have to take the first step towards God? You have to take the first step towards spirituality. It won't come to you, but it's an interactive universe. And if you take that first step, I think you'll find remarkable results. And I must admit, Jacqueline, that has been a major theme in my recovery. When I realize if I'm willing to take that first step, if I'm willing to put in effort, mm -hmm. it comes back to me. But I have to, but I have to take that first step. I have to be willing and not just willing in terms of my theories, because I was always great with theories. Oh, let me tell you this, let, let me tell you that. But my practice sucked. And so when I started focusing on practice, on taking those steps and 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 embracing recovery and and showing up and getting up in the morning and making my bed and doing these like little basic and oh my god, like what a concept, you know? And you felt so proud of yourself. Right. Right? You know, a friend of mine in recovery used to say to me, John, stop trying to be the superstar. Stop trying to hit the, the, the Grand Slam home run in the seventh game of the World Series. Instead, just show up on a daily basis and do an adequate job at a moderate pace. An adequate job at a moderate pace. What's incredible is like, at first I was like, what? Don't you know who I am? I can do so much better than, than that. However, when I've done an adequate job at a moderate pace at all my jobs since then, they love me. I do great. Because I'm not trying to be the center of attention. I'm not trying to be the superstar. I'm satisfied with being a worker among workers. And I think that brings us, Jacqueline, to our transition here from being in treatment to working in treatment. And what did that transition look like for you? It was a journey. It was a slow and steady pace. Um, I was a high school dropout, so I had to get a GED. And while I was doing that, I had to find a job. And I actually found my first job while I was still an outpatient. I was, uh, my mom worked for a plastic surgeon in Long Beach and they hired me part time so it wouldn't conflict with my treatment. The doctor did not feel comfortable with me working there because of my opiate addiction. However, she assured him, she's sober, let's give her a chance. And that little chance, along with treatment and finding my higher power, is really what I needed that. I, need, I needed that break. My mom, work, treatment, my sponsor, going to meetings. These little accomplishments of follow through, slow and steady, is what helped me realize I could get my GED. And I got that, and then I went to community college, and I'm like, I'm gonna become a counselor. Because I was too afraid to pursue something higher, like becoming a social worker and going to Cal State Long Beach. So I, I went to school, and got my associates and then I'm like, well, human services, all these units can transfer over. I'm going to go for the four year. So I got my social worker bachelor's degree and, and can I ask you a question? Uh -huh. um, when you mentioned being a social worker, your eyes light up. I love it. I mean, you obviously have a passion for it. And many people, I don't think they understand what it means to be a social worker, why, what, what is special about being a social worker. I'm wondering if you can help us understand that a little bit. Well, sure. Um, for instance, my, uh, for my bachelor's, my practicum placement was at Tarzana as a substance use um, case manager. And that's what got my foot in the, well, I got my own foot in the door <laughs> originally, but to return to the same facility that I was once a patient, um, it was amazing. I worked in case management for my internship 
and they hired me on for a substance use counselor um, once my internship was completed and I graduated. Um, being a social worker, you can work in many different fields, anything from, you know, hospital setting, hospice, integrated health, which is what my focus is on for my master's, which, you know, co-occurring diagnosis, um, some mental health treatment, substance use disorder. Can I just, just for one second, I just want to be able to uh, clarify for, for people what co-occurring diagnosis is. A co-occurring diagnosis known as co-occurring disorders, it means when people have multiple issues, when they have both like substance use and mental health, when they have um, mental health and diabetes. It's when people have two diagnoses, so both diagnoses have to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me more about, in a sense, like, um, I mean, we're coming to an end here. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, your transition to, 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 to treatment, has it been meaningful for you? It has been the most rewarding career. It, it gives me purpose to wake up in the morning. And watching the people that I work with find their own path and, um, and be able to, to thrive in their own lives and and we're going to be able to learn more about that from you yes in part two yes because in part two jacqueline will be talking actually with a form a former patient yes who's now working in treatment and she will introduce them and we'll learn more um and she will be the host she will take over my role what i can say is that right now i work as a principal content creator for tarzana treatment centers I write their website, I do their news, newsletters, I do their um, everything that needs to be written for the company. And being able to, to work at a company that helps underserved people is so meaningful to me, being able to reach out and give the message. And that's what I love about working in treatment. And it's so much better, as you well know, Jacqueline. Oh my God. It's so much better to be working in treatment as opposed to being in treatment. I agree. <laughs> but I think also when you look at our two stories, you realize that you can make this remarkable shift. Oh, yeah. That this remarkable shift can happen for anyone because it happened for us. Yeah. Amazing. It, it really is. It really is. Yes, it really is fantastic. So um, I think that brings us to our end of part one. And uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. Please stay and, and, and watch part two when Jacqueline will talk to James. And um, if anyone is out there and is in danger or in trouble, I just want you to know there is hope for you. You can make this remarkable shift as well. There is a path to recovery. You can find hope. Hi, my name's Jackie. Welcome to part two for Finding Hope. With us, we have James Stevens. Uh, hi, James. Hello, Jackie. How Thank you? you for joining us. How Thank are you. you? Thank you for having me. I am great. I am great. So we're talking a little bit about recovery, about um, how the cycle of going from addict to now you're a manager of a sober living. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I want to, I want to learn a little bit about your story. Well, okay. I know a little bit about your story because you were a past client of mine, right? Yes. So tell me about what brought you to, uh, to treatment and what made you seek. So I was wondering, what brought you 
to sobriety? What made you decide, hey, I need treatment. I want to get sober. Um, what brought me to treatment is I tried it many times on my own, and I couldn't do it on my own. I realized I needed help. So I went to, I mentioned, I went to Tarzana. Yes, and you uh, were a past client of mine. Yes. And I needed help because I got tired of my life style and my struggles and being sick. What was and your lifestyle? Very irresponsible. And I worked and supported my addiction, but I was always broke. I worked, but yet I was broke. And so it was like a revolving circle of nothing. And it just got worse. And then I became homeless. And then I had to put up with other people that I really didn't want to be around yet because it wasn't worth it to me. Just too much hard times and difficulties. And I wanted a better life and I knew it was out there. I just had to get help to do it. Can you tell me a little bit about what you were using and and y your journey? I mean, like you you said that you were tired of your life and you were tired of the people around you. What did what were you using? Well, I was using methamphetamines and heroin. I started off at a younger age, like it was a thing to do as a teenager. So there was no repercussions. Um, I didn't have no responsibilities. So I was introduced to methamphetamines. It was like the thing to do. And then it became an addiction. But I managed to be somewhat of a function act because I had a job. So it wasn't really big problems because I managed to use a little bit here and there. But be, be, after that, it became full time. And I didn't work. I was just running the streets causing trouble, getting in trouble. And then I couldn't have relationships. My family kind of disowned me. Then I finally got arrested and went, sent to prison. That was a first struggle. And I learned there that I didn't like prison, but my addiction wasn't letting me think that way when I got out. So I paroled to failure. Um, because most of my family was using or drinking and I was influenced by that at a young age, but it didn't affect me until I got older because it seemed like a norm. Yeah. And so that must have been really difficult having not only you know, your own addiction, but here you are, you come out and, and that's probably what helped influence you to use in the first place, being exposed. Yes. Um, I remember the struggles and the arguments my parents had and stuff, but there's, they were more alcoholics than drug addicts. But then my generation got more the drugs, but I yeah. remember as a teenager being drinking because I thought it was cool, but then throwing up all the time and, you know, and then doing it over and over, but it was mm -hmm. cool and, but it wasn't cool. Um, now that I'm sober. It, you know, it, so, it's the lies that we yeah. tell ourselves in our active addiction. Absolutely. Oh, I'm having so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> I remember many a times, and uh, I've done a lot of crazy stuff just from drinking. But then as I got older and into hard drugs, such as methamphetamine and heroin, um, that drinking was just a side addiction. Um, was it like a gateway? Like if you drank, would it like lead? Mo to you using? Most definitely. Um, that's why I don't drink today. For one, if I get a good head change from alcohol, I will be head bound strong to go find drugs and I will find them <laughs> until I do. I think that's really important because a lot of, um, 
a lot of addicts, drug addicts, think, oh, well, alcohol was never an issue for me. Um, so I won't use methamphetamine or I won't use heroin. I'll just have a drink. And then a year or two later, they're back in treatment because they relapse. Mm -hmm. And finally, they realize, oh, well, okay, I can't use any of that because it'll lead back to this. Well, that's me exactly because I've quit drugs on my own because family members or friends said, oh, my God, you're getting too skinny or you look terrible. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what, what? So I would quit cold turkey with no problem. But that was for methamphetamine, not opiates. But I drank because I'm okay because yeah. it wasn't a problem in my life at that time. And then... As I got older and I learned that if I drink and I get drunk or a good head change, it just triggers my addiction and mm -hmm. I have to go find drugs. But I, I've tried that many a times. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I would I would sober up from drugs and I'd go because I was feeling sick or bad. And I'd go down like a half pint of vodka, yeah. just down at like one drink. And that's yeah. not normal. And it wasn't very social. And I didn't really socialize in my addiction or using, um, except when I was trying to make money or make deals. Yeah. So, so tell me, how did you, um, how did you learn about Tarzan and, and what made you enroll in the program? Um, I actually learned from about Tarzana from my sister because she went there. Okay. And, uh, and that's when I went there the first time and did 30 days. In that 30 days, because I wasn't ready, it was more of a pact with my sister, let's get sober together. Um, I had a sack of drugs and I took them with me a couple of times to Tarzan, but I didn't use. And then one day I just couldn't control it. I'm like, I don't need this. And so you you weren't willing. You were you were just going through the motions. Yes. So yes. what changed? Um, or was this another time that you enrolled in Tarzana? No, that was the first time. Okay. And then the second time, I, I went quite a few years until the next time. I think maybe about four years. And things, in my life really, I started thinking about my family and friends, my real friends. and nobody talked to me because I was worthless and who would want to talk to me if I'm too busy fixing something that can't be fixed and not being dependable and not being responsible. And, and then I got tired of the struggle because I worked hard, but I never had no money, you know, See, and you worked hard on, on, on nothing. Exactly. It ended up being a vicious circle of nothing because I never had no money in the bank, didn't have a bank account. And this day, today, I have money in the bank. I have a bank account. I have a car. I'm so legal. It's not funny. <laughs> you know, it, I'm very happy. You know, Good. before I used to see a cop and, or a police officer, and I would really tense up, like, oh, and try and turn the corner, you know? Yeah. So back to when you enrolled in, in Tarzan mm. this last time. Obviously, you were willing. Can you tell me what your journey has been like since so sobriety? How much time do you have and and what is life like now? I'm coming up on 14 years of, or 14 months of sobriety. Awesome. And um, this time I made a decision and I went and I said, I'm going back to Tarzana because I knew the help that was there. Mm -hmm. I just didn't have experience of it, you know. So mm -hmm. I made the decision, which made it a lot easier for me. And I wasn't ashamed to ask for help. I wasn't above that. Like, I can do it myself, like a man thing, you know. Or I don't need no help. I can do this. But I realized I needed help. And I was open for suggestions and advice. Yeah. Um, and I had an awesome counselor. Why, that, thank you. Yes, that helped me a lot because I was a mess when I first started, even though I thought I had it together, but I had it together only because I made the decision to get help. You had you had the you had everything in the making for success because you came in ready. You came in 
willing. You wanted it desperately. It was like your drive and want and need. You had the same motivation towards recovery as you did in your addiction towards getting your fix. Yes, yes. You wanted it the same. Yes. You wanted it just as much as as you did back when you were using and wanting that drug. And that's why I knew working with you that you had you had the the groundwork there. It was there. You the foundation was solid. Um I want to talk about your your medically assisted treatment you came you were enrolled and mm-hmm. you were utilizing suboxone yes and and tell me what made you change from suboxone to vivitrol well um i had i have a sponsor and i told him what i was on and he looked it up because i I guess he wasn't familiar with it, but he looked it up and then he came and told me, we have a conflict of interest here. And I'm like, okay. So I talked to the nurse. Why did he say that there was a conflict of interest? Um, because it's a, a mind altering, mood altering substance. Oh, okay. And so I talked to the MAP counselor and the medical and got stepped down from it. Okay. So I stepped down, but then I wasn't being honest. And so I was cutting little pieces of it. And uh, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not taking a whole strip. But I finally came to realize I was chasing the euphoria of the fill. Uh And my wonderful counselor at Tarzana, Miss Jackie, talked to me about Bibitrol. Yes. And I... How is that? For you it works really good i mean you don't feel nothing but i don't have no cravings or nothing but i do know which helps i do know if i go and use or drink i will get sick or right into withdrawals and i had enough withdrawals to last me a lifetime because it's very uncomfortable and miserable it leaves an impression on us <laughs> yes very much so and um and I remember having them too. And th- th- yes, I don't miss them. But, you know, I take a shot once a month. And it, just knowing that just keeps me aware that if I do decide to relapse or have a thought about it, that it would not be very good. Yeah. But the good thing about that is, is it takes away the cravings. I don't really have cravings. I didn't, at least I don't think I do, but maybe I do. But through the Tarzana program i've learned how to play it forward so yeah. i've had thoughts of drinking not really using but of you know of drinking because I, yeah. I had ran out of gas one time and i had to walk and it was a hot day and i happened to walk by a bar that i frequented yeah. and i said hmm, i could have a beer nobody would know mm-hmm. there goes the line but i played it through yeah i can get away with it once mm-hmm. but then that psychs me myself up that i could possibly go drink again Mm-hmm. And eventually, I'll have one, two, and maybe three, and then start getting drunk, and then I'm going to go straight to drugs. And I was, I would lose everything I have. My yeah. family's back in my life. I have awesome friends, mm-hmm. and I accomplished a lot in my sobriety. And I would lose all that. Speaking of accomplishing a lot, mm-hmm. can you tell me what you're doing now? And you could. You are currently the the manager of a sober living. What's that like working with individuals that are are fresh in recovery or not in recovery? I know that that you've experienced, you know, what's it like to be on the other side of the fence versus um I'm very grateful and I feel that I'm giving back. I share my experience drinking and hope with gentlemen. A lot of them are fresh, either out of jail or from the streets. And I try to share with them where I came from and that I'm in the same neighborhood I grew up in, but I do not go around old friends. And I let them know that I've had to get help 
and counselors, and I mentioned Tarzana or other programs for them. And some guys last, some guys don't, which makes me very aware of alcoholism and addiction, how it is very baffling. There's a phrase, but it, it'll get you. Yeah. Um, no matter how much you think you got it, just one day out of the blue, you'll have a thought and, and just go off unless yeah. you actually think it through and, and have a program or, or a counselor or friends that can help you. Yeah. So having a strong foundation of, of you know, basically relapse prevention plan is yes. important. It's really important. Um, when you're working with these guys, so how has your life changed since completing Tarzana Treatment Center? My life has changed dramatically in a really positive and good way. Um, again, like today's my birthday and it's my second sober birthday. And I've gotten happy birthday wishes from all my sisters and my kids and nieces and nephews. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it means the world to me. Um, and I get a lot of text messages. Hey, we're proud of you because they know me that I used to be a really hot mess in a lot of trouble. I've been in and out of institutions because of my alcoholism and addiction, which made me do a lot of stupid things. But today, I I have two cars. They're all legal. Nothing hot wired. No tickets. I'm insured. Um, I'm tr in training for more of a permanent manager job at this transitional housing. And I just have a lot of wonderful doors opening for me and mm. a lot of good people reaching out to me. That's um, amazing. Yes. And if I was still in, in my old ways, I would have none of that. That's so. amazing. So being able to build or mend these relationships with your family and, and, new friends and some old friends. How is it like uh, being able to to connect with with other individuals in recovery? Um, ones that have been in recovery for a while or ones that are just starting? Ones that are just starting. Um, it makes me feel good to give back. Yeah. And I hope to teach him something just by sharing my experience in strength and hope and the stuff I do. Um, I see some guys that aren't ready and it hurts me, but it also, again, it keeps me aware of how addiction and lifestyle yeah. can draw you back in. Yeah. And one of the things is, is that even if, even if the first time, cause I was a repeated, uh, you know, I go to Tarzana, enroll, drop out of the program or complete the program, return a year later. Yeah. Um, but each time I learn something. Yes. And I think it's incredible that you're that you're taking your past experience and working with these individuals and providing them with even if it's just a little morsel of hope and information that they could carry on and build on, I think it's amazing. How do you plan on maintaining your lifestyle now and what are you hoping to accomplish in the future? Where do you see yourself? Um, I'm staying on the path that I'm on and um, I'm staying connected with treatment with treatment centers or Tarzana, I talk to a lot of people mm -hmm. and I'm just staying focused and I'm not a young man, so I'm trying to catch up on my life, but I'm not chasing it in a sense. And as long as I stay in my sobriety, most things seem to be falling into place for me. Mm -hmm. um, that's a godsend and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I have some school coming up so I'm going to improve my education. 
And your skills. And skills mm -hmm. and become a better per people person. Well, you're already a people person. Yes, but <laughs> I'm almost like a rock star at Tarzana, <laughs> but, which is very good. Yes, so. you are a rock star. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having and me. sharing your story. It means a lot to me. And I love seeing who you've become already. And I can't wait to see who you're going to be in the future. And keep up the good work. Well, thank you. I'm thank really you very proud much. of you. Thank I'm you. I'm really proud of you. And I just want to thank everybody for watching. And thank you to James <laughs> for joining us. Thank you for having me. Brought to you by Tarzana Treatment Centers. You can visit our website at www.tarzanatc.org or call 1-800-996-1051.